2022, 2023, you do not need to have a job. I don't dress fancy, I don't wear bling bling, I don't drive fancy cars. I could, I make millions of pounds. Most people save really hard, they'll make a load of money and then they'll dump it into a house. That don't work anymore. What I'd be doing right now if I started from scratch is I'd be saying, hmm. Samuel, you recently tried to join the World Economic Forum. What was that all about? Yeah, well, I have heard a lot about the World Economic Forum. And the reason I wanted to join was because I wanted to see what it was all about, understand it. There's a lot of conspiracy theories and, or maybe they're not conspiracy theories, maybe they're theories about who they are. And I just thought, well, all these people talking about who they are and what they believe, maybe I, I'm the person to actually find out. So really it was kind of... Um, it, it was just a, a, a research purpose. So do you believe the governments are there to look like they're running the world and really it's the economic forum and people like that that are actually running the world? I mean, definitely. There's, there's if, if you look at the prime minister and the people that are the puppets that are supposed to be in power, clearly they're being told what to do and, and what to, of course. And, you know, and you see a lot of people, don't you, you know, rich people that will donate, you know, 20 million quid to their to their party. It's not because they believe in the party. They're doing it for power. So very clearly, 100%. I'm not saying that the World Economic Forum are responsible for everything. And I spend more time studying my own business than trying to study the World Economic Forum. I'm not about spending 10 hours a day researching who runs the world because I run my world. I run my business. I create my economy. People, people get very upset though. They're, oh my gosh, they're going to make everyone poor. And they're gonna... No, you create your own economy. I create my economy. So I'm not going to spend 10 hours a day researching, thinking, doing loads and loads of videos. I create my own economy. I'm studying my own business. I'm studying myself. I'm studying my market. But yeah, I, th I'm, I think everybody should be aware somewhat and do some research on who pulls the strings. Well, they understand. released a statement, didn't they? Say, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Yes. And it's very ironic that the people that are really rich in the World Economic Forum, part of the royal family, like Prince Charles is, is, is a member, are saying, you should own nothing and be happy about it when they own everything. It, it, it's just very ironic and strange. And I think that a lot of people that get extremely wealthy, and I have this in my own company, if you're extremely wealthy, you, humanly and selfishly, you might want people to be dumbed down so that they can work for you and be good employees. So I think on a, on a massive global scale, we have very rich people that control everything. And as a result, financial literacy is not taught in schools. So you go to school, leave with zero financial education, don't even know how to, how to write a check or understand what good debt is compared to bad debt, passive income, active income, assets, liabilities, nothing. So you leave school completely financially illiterate and then go to university and get in debt. And, and you're a debt slave forever. And you're a debt slave forever. And then you're, and you climb to the top of the corporate ladder and realise that you climbed the wrong ladder. But, but it's too late, you're 67. I saw a TikTok the other day. It was saying that society puts down people that want to earn money. It's almost seen as bad that you want to achieve more. Mm. Um, and oh, money isn't everything, just follow your passions. But if you want to earn money, there's nothing wrong with that. 100%. I see that all the politicians, the bankers are in this little clique, the World Economic Forum. So I looked into it and I found out it cost half a million pounds to become a partner. And I thought, damn, I'm going to become a partner. I've got the money. I'm like, I'll pay. I'm good. Um, can I become a partner? I filled out this, this application form. Do you know what? I've never felt so poor because it was like, <laughs> what is your annual turnover? Um, and it was like um, 10 million to a billion. To a billion, wow. A billion to 10 billion, 10 <laughs> billion to 100 billion. I was like, okay, I'm bottom of the food chain here. So yeah, it was, it was, it was an interesting. And they just said, you know, what, what, what do you believe in? And how do you, how would you want to change the world and stuff like that? So I filled it out very well. I hoped that they would accept me and they did not even get back to me. Maybe they want power or they want you, the person with the power to want to join. And I clearly haven't got enough power or just don't sign up for what they believe. I don't know. It's strange. And um, I did a bit of research into the World Economic Forum and... It's scary stuff. <laughs> so someone else who talks about the system and being trapped in the matrix is Andrew Tate. And obviously you had him on recently and yeah. interviewed him. How was that experience? Yeah, it was great. I mean, it was the second time I've interviewed Andrew. Yeah. The first time um, I didn't put it out because he had to leave partway through the interview right. to sort out his supercar. <laughs> Strange experience. <laughs> However, yeah, it was good, man. I really enjoyed my, my two times meeting Andrew. And I think- So were they like recently together, those two times? No, the first time was actually in April before he was- 
massively famous. Right, okay. It was only about 20 minutes and then he had to leave. And I just took the mickey out of him for it because he talks about like freedom and everything. Um, but then he had to leave 20 minutes because he was all stressed about his car, which had broken down. And I even called him out on it on the interview. I was like, come on, dude. Like, you know, you got all this money, mm, but then yeah. you're stressed out about your car. Come on, bro. Um, get nah, someone to sort it yeah, out Yeah, get for someone you. to sort it out. Because yeah. when I was on my way to a podcast, my car broke down and I literally just dumped it at the side of the road, jumped on an Uber, got to the venue mm. and text my PA. And I, I finished my interview and my car's outside, all fixed. Yeah. My wheel's mm. fixed. That's what happens when you've got mm. money. I'm not saying he doesn't have money. He's clearly very rich. And he is... A genius and he's a great marketer mm. and he's um got a lot of great points and the interview i have to give andrew some credit because it was the most popular interview i've had on my entire channel i've literally never had a video as popular on my entire channel and i'm really grateful for for andrew tate coming down giving mm. his time up and and doing an interview with me um enjoyed it he gave a lot of golden nuggets in percentage terms how much would you say you agree with the andrew tate philosophy and that's the stuff that you question. don't agree with what are they? that's yeah. a great question um I mean, I don't necessarily know what if I could put a percentage on it because I don't know what his view is on everything. In terms of bus the business stuff, I would say I probably agree with 80, 90% of what he talks about. Does yeah. he, what does he think about um, buying properties and assets? We, we had an argument about that. So he believes that property can be taken from you by the government. Mm -hmm. So he thinks that it's risky because if you step out of line, the government will take your property from you. And I was like, dude, dude, if you're going to go down the nth degree, they could take away your gold. Mm. They could, you, I mean, they could take away anything. They could close mm. down your business. They can close down your bank. They can lock you in a room with bars on the window. Correct. And I actually said to him, interestingly, they closed down your bank, right? He said, yeah. And I said, but did they take your property from you? He said, no. Mm. Proves my point. So he then talked about how he had it structured though and it's owned in a trust and a this yeah. and a that. So it's like, cool. Well, that's the way to do it. But so I, no, I think, I don't think we disagree that much. I think that when we actually thrashed it out, um, but it's great. I love debating people. And Andrew, mm. the thing I respect about Andrew so much is the fact that he's a critical thinker and he's happy to debate anything with anyone. Where I don't like people is when they have opinions, but then when you challenge them, I go, come on, do you want to debate mm. this? Mm. They're then like, hide away. Whereas Andrew's happy to debate anything. And I think he's happy to be proved wrong on stuff. He's just very rarely wrong. So what motivated you to start in business and become an entrepreneur? So when I was 16 years old, I became a Christian. I gave my life to Jesus. I'm not perfect Christian. I'm not perfect person. Um, I got plugged into a local church. My church saw that I had a lot of energy, a lot of passion. I, how, how, I think did we can see that. that. I know. <laughs> how did they see that? I, I've always been passionate. So I had a lot of passion, a lot of energy. So I'm like 16, 17 years old. I'm mm. at church. I'm on the front row. I'm passionate. <laughs> I didn't have any money, working class. We don't want to hear education. you sing, by the way. I'm a good singer too. <laughs> we heard that earlier when you came out the Oh, no, okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So um, they sent me on, well, not sent me, but they kind of opened the doors up for me to do some traveling. I went to a uh, Potha Blanco, works in a drug rehab center. I was helping people get off drugs and picking olives and they were selling the olives and whatever. I was there for a few weeks. I went to uh, Zambia, Africa. I was working in a school called Chengalo School. I went to Ludiana. I was working in um, orphanages, building orphanages. So I'm a teenager. And I was so touched and I went out to make an impact, but I came back impacted. I went out to be a blessing, but came back blessed. And I was so keen to like build a school, build, help. I, I, in Zambia, I, I, I met some kids that were drinking out of a river that was not clean because there was no clean water. And I'm like, man. So I'm thinking when I become successful, I'm going back and I'm going to do something because I'm, the, a lot of the people in my church were spending so much time fundraising and trying to, oh, we raised 150 quid this week. And I'm thinking, mm. I think I could make that. So I became an entrepreneur initially because I wanted to be able to write the checks for the missions within my church. That was the initial reason. So it wasn't money for the sake of money. It was money to make a difference. Even now, I don't dress fancy. I don't wear bling bling. I don't drive fancy cars. I could. I make millions of pounds. I never did it because I wanted to have lots of things materially. And the other reason that I started business was because it was all that I'm good at. My dad made me work for him as an entertainer. I didn't like it. I was paid 25 pound a day. I failed in school. I couldn't tie my shoelaces. I've got ADHD, dyslexia, rubbish, 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 rubbish at PE. Can't play football. Not good with the girls. Just a failure. But I was good at making money. And I remember my teacher when I was about 14 years old that saw my Bradford and Bingley little purple book with three and a half thousand pounds in it. And she said... Where's that come from? I said, a paper round, washing cars. She goes, you got more money than me. The self-esteem that gave me. I've got more money than you and you're my teacher. Woo, wow, that's that's giving me confidence. Mm. That's that I'm good at making money. Yeah. So I might not be good at this and this and this. I might not get into uni, but I know how to make money. But first we'd like to say thank you to our sponsor, public.com. 
Dad, a hundred years ago when you started investing, what steps did you take to become a better investor? Well, I used to take tips from the local meat market. If only you had public.com back then. Public is an investing platform that not only gives you the information and tools you need to make smarter investments, they also have a built-in optional social feature filled with analysts and notable investors to share their thoughts and help you be a better investor. Well, that sounds good, but I'm more into index funds than individual stocks. Oh, I thought you might say that. Well, Public offer ETS, which is like a bundle of different stocks put together that can help you diversify your investments during economic downturns. And coming soon, Public will have art, collectibles, and more. Wow, surely it doesn't get any better than that. Well, you're in for some luck, old man. (laughs) Steady, son. The best part is they've got $0 fees on standard stock trades, and you can get a free stock worth between $3 and $1,000 when you invest with the link in the description below. Wow, that's brilliant. Back to the podcast. So what drew you to property initially? 16 years old, I was working for my dad as an entertainer, doing children's parties, magic shows. I was also cleaning snooker tables. I was also doing plastering. I was just a jack of all trades, trying to make some dollar, trying to make some money. And I was working hard and I was doing this, 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 this. But what came first was my work for my dad because my dad was my, my kind of my boss. He told me what to do. And my dad used to always say to me, you know, you have to work on a Sunday, you have to do this. And I felt a little bit trapped. So after three months of leaving school of working for my dad, I Googled, my dad is keeping me poor. And I came across the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Right, yeah. And that was the book, the first book I ever read cover to cover. What an eye opener. Oh man, yeah. I can't believe I came across the book and read it's it. It's like one of those light bulb moments, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the fact that I saw that all the rich people on the Sunday Times Rich List were some way or another involved in property made me think, I want to do property. I don't want to sell bits of cars. I want to do property. I don't want to make a passive income from a vending machine. I want to make it from a house. I, I, properties a rich person's game and I want to get rich. So I wanted to do property, quit working for my dad and flew, f- threw myself in. And it was embarrassing. It was humiliating. I didn't have any money. I didn't have any credit. I was too young to buy a house. A lot of people laughed at me. But after a tough few years of struggle, um, you know, I managed to kind of hmm. make it. So were you flipping initially or deal sourcing? What what were you doing in property? I actually, I actually wasn't. A te- no, the, f- the first deal I ever officially did was a house that I bought because back in these days, this was just before like all the houses and crash and everything. Um, what you would do is you'd buy a house cheap on a bridge and then you'd refinance it the same day. Mm. And the refinance, 75, 80% would pay off the bridge. That was what everyone was doing. I mean, this was happening with a company called Mortgage Express. Just to so make sure people are aware, the bridge is a bridging loan, isn't correct. it? So it gave you the money for that deposit so you could refinance, bang that away. And a bridging loan is obviously quite an expensive thing to have out too long. Yeah, so you pay it straight back. That was the strategy I learned. So I was finding deals, but I couldn't buy it because I was too young. And I, when I was 17 years old, was thinking, when I turn 18, oh, I'm going to be doing this all day long. I can't wait. When I'm 18... And I got the rug pulled from underneath when I spoke to a mortgage broker. His name was Mark. And Mark said to me, you do realize to get a buy-to-let mortgage, you need to be 21. And I was like, damn. And suddenly it just became, oh, I've been sold a dream. My stepdad, who I did not get on with, who married my mom at twelve when I was 12, who I didn't get on with, he offered to be my mortgage host, my guarantor. And for me, that really touched. And you know what he said? He said, he goes, I, I, I was feeling like a failure at the time. Like, oh, I've spent all this money on property. I'm, I'm an embarrassment. He goes, I've been watching you. I'm really proud of, of what you've been doing. You know, he was the first person in, in really in my family that was just like totally believing in me. Did your relationship change after that? Yeah, completely changed. Yeah, yeah completely changed. And he became, um, you know, he back, basically backed, he didn't give me any money, but he backed my first deal. He used his credit and whatever. And then I thought, damn, I don't even have to wait until I'm 18 then. I can just do this now. So I got, I got my first house, 21A Merivale Road, um, 100 grand house, um, just before my 18th birthday, 17 years old. I still own it today. Now it's worth 300 grand. It's also made me 200 grand in rent. So I've made half a million quid off that first deal that I did when I was 17. Um, and I thought, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to use my stepdad. I'm going to do this. But then everything changed. The housing market crashed. And that was when I started, okay, now I need to get creative and learn lease options and but that's a prime example as well of holding on to something as well. Yeah. Um, you haven't lost that 100 grand when that property crashed. If you'd have sold, it might have been 75, 80. Correct. But you haven't sold. You've held. Yeah. And now it's 300,000. So when people say, oh, blimey, you, you you advised me to invest in this stock or or this sort of property, at the end of the day, it's all about when you sell, isn't it? Mm. You know, you, yeah. It's only a paper loss until you've sold it and it becomes an actual loss. 100%. And particularly that's the case, Mark, if you're making profit from it every month. So if you buy Bitcoin 
and you spend 10 grand on Bitcoin and then it drops to six, you only lose if you sell, right? Mm. However, with property, it's even better. Because not only have you not lost because you haven't sold, if you're making, I was, when, when I bought that house, it crashed, fine. I didn't sell, so it doesn't matter. But I was making a grand a month because I was renting out room by room. So again, my friends were like, oh, it's gone down. It's crashed. You got in at the worst time. But I'm thinking, why yeah, does but- that make them happy? Oh, because, because it's amazing, isn't it? love to see failure. Yeah. You know, if you were doing that in the States, they'd feel sorry for you. And they'll pat you on the back when you're doing well. But over here, it does seem that there's a whole bunch of people that want to go, you're down, you're down. It, I'll, even, be, I'll be monitoring it for you. You're yeah. down. At, at the golf club when uh, they were talking about Bitcoin, weren't they? And oh. they say, oh, you're down on your Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> it all when depends you, on what I paid for it, yeah, mate. Yeah. <laughs> when, yeah. when you win, people are quiet. When you lose, everyone's loud. And it, it, I think it's because it's because their employees, they're paid two grand a month. They're doing them. And when you step out, they kind of don't want to lose you as a friend. And then when they see that you fail, they're like, oh, maybe we'll have you back. Is it about clawing you back, do you yeah. think? Because there's definitely some mentality to that, isn't there? It's crab mentality. I don't know mm. if you've heard this. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, crabs in a bucket. Yeah, you put five crabs in a the bucket, they'll die in there. Because every time someone, one of the crabs tries to get out, the others will put it down. It's crab mentality. Mm. And it's just human nature. Very British. Very anti-money, anti thinking outside the box, anti-entrepreneurship. And I think it's the case even on a bigger scale. Like if a celebrity falls or has some big problem or goes back, everyone's like celebrates almost. It's disgusting. With the potential property market crash coming, yeah. what can people do to benefit from that? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the interesting thing is, I believe that you can make money in property regardless of what the market's doing. If the market's going up, great, it's going up you can make money. If it's going down, great, you can make money. What most people do is most people find a reason to not invest. Mm. So most people will say, oh, the market's going up. It's too hard. Every time I try and book a viewing on a house, I'm getting gazumped. I'll wait until the market falls a bit. And then when the market falls a bit, oh, it's scary. Yeah, it's falling. It's falling. It's like the best time to plant the tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. I actually think it's more profitable and lucrative to make money in a crash in property because... Houses are crashing, especially when there's fear. Like I just, I I was buying a house um, about a month ago in High Wycombe for four hundred thousand pounds, and I was getting gazumped on it, and it, someone outbid me. And, oh, great! Now I'm getting calls from people in High Wycombe saying, "Oh, some there's, there's just been a house fall through. It was being sold for four hundred grand. However, if you're a cash buyer, you know, and and then and they're accepting three twenty. You couldn't get 80 grand discount on a 400 grand house two months ago. No, and be the only buyer as well. The only buyer. C- cash is king. If you're a cash, if you are, if you have a lot of cash right now, then you are laughing because getting a mortgage is hard. Interest rates are really high. Are, they, are that, they really high? I, I, I don't think really historically they're high. They're higher than they were, but yeah. they're not really high. I think they're uh, still workable. Here's the thing though, Mark. It is still workable, but not only are interest rates high. They're like, they were like 3%. Now they're more like 6, 7%. But house prices are a lot higher than they were. So buy to let right now, it's tough. Because if if you're, if, let's say 20 years ago, when there might've been 8%, the house prices were much smaller. So if you've got a 75% mortgage, you can be paying much less. Whereas now, if you, the average house is 300 grand. So if you're getting a mortgage and you've got a mortgage of 225 grand and you're paying 6, 7%, that ain't, that, that ain't, that, it's not going to even get covered by the rent. So you're a bit screwed. So buy, it's traditional buy to let right now. Buy in a, unless you're going really far up north, maybe it can work. But if you just buy, if around here, I mean, how much is the average house around here? About half a million? Well, the average house actually is probably about 400,000, I think. Yeah, and the rent yeah maybe, semi, sort of three right. bedroom semi. And the rent might be what, 1,200, 1,500? You, yeah, 1,500, 1,600. Right, so if you buy a house for 400 grand and rent it for 1,600 and get a mortgage, you're done. Mm. You don't make profit. Mm. Well, my friend, and I, I think you know him as well, James Sinclair recently yeah. did a video on saying why he's not buying to rent any longer. Certainly yeah. not at the moment because he can't see a high enough return in it. So. Yeah. So, so, however, people might think, oh, aren't you <laughs> advocating property? That vanilla buy to let investing, I wouldn't say it's dead, but it's very difficult to get high returns from that. However, there are things you can do, like, for instance, property flipping. Mm. So buying houses, really cheap for cash. And then pushing the value up and selling it, making a hundred grand profit, bang, that's happening loads. Or um, buying a house and renting it out, but renting it out as serviced accommodation instead. So you're renting it out on a nightly basis mm, and mm. getting a really high rent. Well, like something like Airbnb. Airbnb yeah. yeah. Yes. So we've got a property in Litchfield where the rent would probably averagely be a grand. It's a small little cottage, be about mm, a grand. Mm. We're getting four grand. 
Mm. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Airbnb uh, model. Yeah, four grand. Yeah, I, I think it's nice when it's an experience. Like recently, I booked an apartment with um, the downstairs was a cave cinema. Mm. It's like those ones I, I see they're they're the ones going to thrive in this time because yeah. people, my generation anyway, value experiences over anything else. Really, I think the biggest thing that a lot of entrepreneurs do right now in the property space, which I advocate and teach and show people, is renting apartments for like 800 quid in nice popping areas like Windsor or, you know, nice areas, Quirk, Oxford, Cambridge, or by the beach, renting a studio apartment or a one bedroom apartment for 800 quid. And then obviously with the correct permissions and everything, of course, the correct contract. And then with permission from the landlord, listing that property on Airbnb yeah, and getting 80 quid, 90 quid a night yeah, yeah, with a 70, with a 70% occupancy. Honestly, I've got guys that I'm working with at the moment, I'm training. They're making on average about 1200 quid profit from a deal. They're, they're, they're not paying rent up front. They're, they're saying to the landlord, um, can we start the contract in three weeks time? Great, cool, start it in three weeks time. Oh, in the meantime, do you mind if we get the keys to sort of stage the property, furnish it? So they're marketing the property so that the day of the tenancy, bang, they're making money. Yeah. They're not paying deposit because they're saying to the landlord, it's a company let. If Here's another thing. Another reason buy to let is really st- tough is because if a tenant doesn't pay rent, what can you do? Not a lot. Not a lot. However, because landlords are scared of tenants, if you say to a landlord, you don't want to rent to a tenant, mm. rent it to me, a company. Guaranteed because, income. Because if I don't pay you rent, I'm it's not my home. So you can evict me. I have no rights. So the landlord's happy. Your tenants aren't tenants, they're guests. So they have no rights. So there's no tenants involved. And you're making a grand a month You've practically put nothing into the deal. Do that twice and you've replaced an income. You do not need to have a job. 2022, 2023, the opportunities in the market are so ripe. And not just in property. Property is all I know. But there's so many online, different. there's so much stuff you can do. And I think people are realizing, younger entrepreneurs are realizing, people that are 20, 25, that you don't need to spend 40 years working in a job that you hate for 40 hours a week to then retire on 40% of what and you couldn't die. afford to live on in the first place <laughs> and die. Yeah, die. So people people are realizing that now and people are being a bit more entrepreneurial and, and, and property is a vast, very large pie. And you can cut the pie up in different ways. You can, as you mentioned, you could be a deal sourcer. Like what I'd be doing right now if I started from scratch is I'd be saying, hmm, if I'm a cash buyer, I can get rid of good deals, but I'm not a cash buyer. Why don't I find a good deal as if I'm a cash buyer and negotiate really good and then pass it on to a real cash buyer because cash buyers tend to be busy. So they'll pay me three, five grand. Would for you time. see that as entrepreneurship or just another job though? Because that's it, deal sourcing could be seen as a job or a it's business. Not, it's not passive, but it's massive. Yeah. If you can make 5,000 pounds from finding a deal and passing it on to a, a client, yeah. how long is it going to take you? A few days? This is deal brokering, isn't it? Right. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you, but you can, I, I, I've got students of mine doing 10 a month. If you do that 10 times, I've got, I got many students I can name to you right now who are making 25 up to 50 grand a month doing that. So, oh, is it just another job? Name a job where you can make 50 grand a month. A, a high paid job maybe. But yeah, yeah, which takes you 20 <laughs> years to get the... Yeah. So so it's not passive income. Yeah. It's it's but it's active income, but mm. it's very good income. You use that income to then reinvest in property. Mm. And while you're making that income, you're learning on the job. You're growing. You're the very best deals you can keep for yourself. Mm. Well, I'm talking about deals there. Uh, you recently did a video where you bought 10 houses for 50,000 down. Yeah, I didn't, I, I, I was, I, it was a theoretical video to be oh, fair. Oh, okay. Um, but it's, it's a strategy that I do. But yeah, ten, how, how to buy um, 10 houses for 50 grand. Can you explain a bit of that then? Yeah, sure. So t- if, I, if I've got 50 grand and I want to buy 10 houses, um, what I'm going to do is, because what most people do is most people save really hard They'll make a load of money and then they'll dump it into a house. And then they'll save the money up again and they'll dump it into a house. That don't work anymore because how can how can an average person save up 50 grand? So you're just tying up way too much money. You're tying up way too much mm. money. So the strategy is, and this is what I do, and this is what I teach, is if you've got 50 grand, buy a house, but buy a house that is run down, buy the worst house in the best street, so instead of buying a house for 200 grand that's in perfect, pristine condition and renting it out, find a house in the same street that's really run down that needs 50 grand spending on it. It's got structural problems. It's a mess, but buy it for 100 grand. Buy it cash. Mm. If you haven't got cash, you can get a bridging loan. It doesn't need to be your cash. Buy it for 100 grand. Then spend 50 grand at doing it up. 
Don't have to be your money. You can get a bridging line. I've got my own bridging company because a lot of people say, oh, how do you get bridging now? So I set my own company up. There you go. I can give you bridging, right? Yeah, it makes sense. If you've got the demand there, right. yeah, why yeah. not service mm, right. it? Right. Yeah. So now you bought a house for 100 grand, you spent 50 grand on it, but now it's worth 200 grand because you've added value. So now what you do is you now refinance it, Bang. get a 75% mortgage loan to value, and they'll give you 75% of the new value. So instead of getting a mortgage before you buy, get a mortgage after you buy. So they'll give you 150 grand, which pays back. Your, you get your 50 grand back and you can pay the bridging company back and then you go again. So it's keep... recycling money. Correct, yeah. correct. Yeah, that makes and sense. And that, uh, that is how most wealthy people do do property. Well, most people that are wealthy look at money as a fluid thing, don't they? Yeah. It's it just flowing around. So you just ride on that fluid cash. Yeah. And if you can tie that in with them renting the house out as serviced accommodation or rent it out room by room as a HMO and you're recycling your money and you're getting high cash flow from it. I mean, listen, like, yeah, it's theoretical. It sounds easy for you to just say it. In reality, you've got builders. Of you've course. Got yeah, it yeah. takes work. It's a yeah, business, yeah. you know. But if you can master that and do that well, like I did, you can make a lot of money. You mentioned HMOs. What are your thoughts on those? And they are houses of multiple occupancies. Yes. Brilliant. I love HMOs. The mm. best. They get a bad rep, though. Do they? Well, some of the landlords do. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's why they're re they are regulating HMOs. It's mm. quite a regulated industry, so you can't just buy a house and like this house that we're in right now it wouldn't be an ideal HMO it's far too big um, <laughs> but, yeah. Well, yeah. well, and we've just added the north wing as well so. oh right. yeah I have to see that yeah. alright but if you take a big house and you rent, want to rent it out room by room you need a license to do that and to get a license costs about a thousand quid and you also have to get planning permission sometimes And however if it's a smaller property so if it's like just a four bed HMO and you rent it out room by room it's much less regulated there's still some regulations um, so that is you know, that is helping clamp down on some of the, because what some people do is they rent out little crappy rabbit run rooms mm. and it's horrible conditions. And Well, that's what I was going to say, because if I was to go down the HMO route, which yeah. I, I must admit, looking at it at the moment, I don't like how it, most of them look, shall we say. Yeah. Um, I would want to be like high end HMOs Correct. for, you know, professionals, you know, city professionals yeah. or people like that so that they can actually go, yeah, well, I'm in a HMO, but it's like my own little apartment. It's very nice. 100%. Here's the interesting thing about HMOs. The average room for a HMO used to be about 350 quid across across England. Now it's about 600 quid. So more as we enter into a recession and as people are more and more hard up, people are wanting to move out of apartments and live in a room because they haven't got much money. Because rent, if the average salary is two grand a month and the average rent now is a grand and, you're, and your average bills are a few hundred quid, but they're tripling. That means if you're on two grand a month, <laughs> you're stuffed. So what are you going to do? You're going to rent a room. So whose room are you going to rent? My room. Why my room? Because my room's the best. And how, am I going to, how much am I going to charge? 600, 700 quid. And I've got five people in one house. That means I'm making, I'm making a rent of what? Three grand a month or so. When if I rented it out as a normal family home, I'd make a grand. So it's a much more profitable way to make money renting it out room by room, as long as you do it properly and you understand the market. Yeah, I think it's a shame, really, because obviously most people that do HMOs are making a lot of money, uh, but it does seem to me that they're trying to squeeze every last ounce of money out of it. And if a window needs fixing, they're not bothering. If the, mm. if the cold's coming in, they're not bothered. If it's damp, they're not bothered. But they could actually just up their game just yeah. a little bit and they wouldn't get the bad rep. I think that in any business, you know people say greedy landlords, greedy landlords, squeezing every penny. I don't think greedy landlords exist. I don't think there's such a thing as greedy landlords. It doesn't make sense. And here's why I don't think it exists. Because if you don't fix things and charge high rents and are a, a stereotypical greedy landlord, you don't have tenants. I don't know. Is there enough competition though, especially with um, university rooms? Because I know my ex-girlfriend used to live in this horrible house. And she said, oh, it was the only one we could get. You know, it was in the area. Everything else was getting booked up. How long, how, does she live there now? Uh, she's moved to a different place. There but, we go. There we go. Yeah. So if you're a crappy, greedy landlord, you end up actually making less money. So vote with your feet. Yeah. Get out. Yeah. And There'll if you, always and if be you, something better But I bet there's else. someone else in that house now. Like, it's not empty. Yeah, but the, the, the turnover of tenants, yeah. every time a tenant moves out and someone else moves in, they have to pay the agent one month's rent. It doesn't pay. So a, a greedy landlord or one that wants to get every penny and make as much as they can is actually a landlord that realises that their house is the product and the tenant is their customer and provides a good service. Mm. I don't know any landlord that's really rich that operates like that. It's, it does happen and it's wrong and it should be regulated. But 
I don't think it pays to do that. I think you're going to make more money in the long run. But if you cut corners, you're going to cut profits. Mm. Yeah, recently we had someone on the podcast called Simon Squibb. I don't know if you know him. He's, he's quite big on TikTok now. Um, but he was saying property shouldn't be a business because it's a human right to have a house. I would like to get your comment on that. I think it's stupid. If property is not a business, that means that we should leave the government to do, do property for us, which means that we're going to end up in a far worse state because capitalism is a good thing. And when... It's like what I said about when 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 landlords realise I've oh, been a greedy landlord doesn't work. If I want if I want to make good money, I need to provide a good service. Then what that means is it means that tenants have got more choice. I mean, any, any country that's tried to do you know the do gooders the campaign and then they end up doing things like freezing rents, capping rents, or taking properties off of the rich and giving it to the government, it always ends up in absolute crappy living, devastation. And you just need to look back at history to mm. see this. And so- if you look at socialism, I mean, I went to Romania a few years ago and it's street after street after street of concrete apartment block yeah. and they're all crap. Right. And you want to move? Well, yeah, we've got a, one that's uh, just as crap down the road. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's the situation. I suppose so. there's no competition yeah. no. Um, when everything's run by the government. You hit the nail on the head there, Curtis. There's no competition. When the government are saying we'll provide housing for everybody, oh, greedy landlords, we'll have the houses, we'll give it you for free. There's no competition. I mean, there's no competition. You have you end up with crap houses, no choice. You can't, it's just terrible. What do you think about commercial property? Are you into that much? Um, yeah, we do have some commercial properties. Um, more so conversions rather than just dumping money in commercial property. I think that, I mean, it has its merit. I don't think it's as profitable as residential. I don't think it's as profitable as development. I don't think it's as profitable as conversions. Um, because you can obviously do a conversion within a commercial property and do like a HMO yeah, setup within yeah. units and get yeah. those down to non-rateable value so that startups can get in. And that seems quite a good yeah. uh, area of commercial property. Yeah, and you can also get, comm- like some of our properties are commercial. We have commercial valuations on them because if a HMO is a large, if it's a large, you know, six bedrooms with en suites or more, you can get commercial values on it. Namely, it's valued based on the on the rent. Um, but I haven't really gone big on investing in loads of shops and warehouses and stuff like that. Not to say that I never would. A lot of shops out there ripe for conversion, though, isn't there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's and uh, offices. high streets going all over the place, unfortunately. Yeah. And offices. Yeah. And they're the best because shops are usually in conservation areas, so it's difficult to get planning. But if you get an office block, you don't even need planning permission. Permitted development. So what are some key lessons uh, if you could go back as a as a teen or, or see yourself as a teen, you could teach yourself now? I think it's just belief, you know. That's why when I go into schools and I, and I share with schools, it's just you can do whatever you want. Um, I don't think that I'd, I've got any regrets or would say, I wish I knew this because that'd be strange because I was a millionaire by 25. So for me to say like, oh, if only I knew that sooner. I mean, I, I, I succeeded quite early. Um, but yeah, it's just belief, believing in yourself, not caring what people think, thinking outside the box. And even when you've got people in authority telling you you can't do it or that's not right or that's wrong, just go with your gut, go with your intuition and push out, push the boundaries. A big mission of mine is to change the school curriculum and to bring in financial education and financial literacy into the schools is is well, there's a big drum being beaten about that at the moment and we're certainly on a mission for that it's been yeah. our our mission since we started doing the youtube journey yeah. um because of how we discovered that we wanted to do this was the fact that i thought this would be taught in schools by now and it was the fact that we had some kids around the table didn't we on a trip we went on and they knew nothing about finance nothing about business and these are 17 18 year old kids and i thought well it's got to be covered yeah. by now because the basics are simple. You know, if you've got the basics, you can long. build, can't you? You could sp- give them give them two days with me throughout the, throughout the however many years, 15 years of study, two days with me. Or, and I, I mean, I am in conversation with some schools at the moment about putting some online curriculums t- together. And, I, you know, I definitely share that. In 2020, you got cancelled. What did that teach you about the world? <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't have said I got cancelled. Okay. Well, yeah. Just, uh, let's say you had a shit storm that was happening in 2020. What did that teach you? I guess it taught me to care and be accountable to six people, which is I'm accountable to God. I'm accountable to my customers. I'm accountable to my staff. I'm accountable to my family. I'm accountable to my church. And I'm, an account- I'm accountable to me. And that's it. And if I'm getting 
online trolls saying stuff or journalists, even respected journalists talking about me, I am not accountable to them. So, and I think it gave me thick skin because it forced me to study every aspect of myself and my business. Um, my business is better as a result. I'm better as a result. Um, I didn't know what cancellation or mob meant. I didn't, I didn't know anything about that at the time. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I learned a lot really. I don't know if I was counseled though. How did you um, mentally deal with it though? And what kind of toll did it take? It was tough. It was. I mean, especially when people, you know, online were sort of bringing my family into it, you know, right into my family, right into my pastor of my church, trying to get everybody to disassociate from me and trying to ruin my life. Every time I'd go on a podcast, they'd write to the, you know, that it was only a small group of people, but they would have multiple email accounts, multiple, and they'd be like, it was all orchestrated. Like, right, let's all write, you, you know, um, yeah, it was it was it was really tough and it was really annoying and it was horrible and it affected me personally, it affected me financially. Um, fortunately, a lot of the people that were doing that that were responsible got caught and we managed to find screenshot evidence and, and whatnot and we took legal action. And as a result, we've been compensated financially. And I mean, there's one guy who was sending nasty messages to my wife and really bad, who's you know now doing because. Um, what do you call it? Community service. He's got criminal records. <laughs> well, we've sat down and spoken before about the pressure selling side of courses. Yeah. And it's certainly something I'm not comfortable with. And that's why obviously we provide everything free to air basically, yeah. um, because we don't want to charge uh, on in, in the same way. Yeah. Um, and I did say to you before, um, I think it would go a long way sometimes to be able to actually physically say, look, no, yeah, if you're putting that on a card that's not gone through, look, give it a few months, give, give it six months, maybe give it a year, you know, get build that cash up, be able to afford to do what you want to do, what you've been inspired now to do. Just give it a bit of time. You've got time. We'll help you shortly. But yeah. do your research, learn as much as you can in the meantime. Yeah, no, I think I wouldn't disagree with you. I think you're right. And I think that, um, you know, I mean, in my defense, I mean, I, I do passion, I call it passion, passion selling. Mm. You know, I do passion sell. And I think that, you know, whether I'm selling a deal or anything. No. Well, you know it works. That's the thing. You know it works, but it does need that customer or that client to have a certain amount of cash also to make it work, doesn't it? it yeah. It's not just time. You know, they've got, yeah. they've got to do the courses. They've got to have a little bit behind them. Mm. And as a salesman, it's also very hard to gauge who can and can't afford something, isn't yeah. it? And it, yeah. actually, as a salesman, it's not your job. It's like... Sorry, but it, what business in the world does that? If you go and buy a car, I want to buy a, I want to buy a Lamborghini or I want to buy a Mercedes. It's a hundred grand cash. They don't go. Can you definitely afford it? If the person's got the money and says I want it, they don't go. Is it going to be getting you into debt though? Are you? If someone's took a loan out for the car and they've got the money in their bank account, the Mercedes guy doesn't go. But can you afford to pay back the loan? That's the bank's job. If the banks gave you the loan, yeah, the difference is like you're uh, you have this personal brand that fronts up the business, yeah. so yeah, it's true. It's an easier target, yeah. you know, yeah, to then true. look at you and be like, oh, you're doing this, you're pressure selling, blah blah blah, yeah, yeah, rather than like, oh, Lamborghini sold me this and they didn't tell me. It's it, true. It's, it's true. less of a target. It is true, and I think that if people criticize me for, they think that you know the way I sell is too aggressive, or you know, I'll, I'll take that and I'll I'll listen and I'll I'll take it on board. Do you think like the the hatchet is buried with all of that now? You've gone through the court cases and now you're just pushing forward bigger and better yeah, things. Yeah, 100%. I mean, some of the court cases are still ongoing. Right. So it's very slow mm -hmm. going to court, especially high court defamation. And with COVID obviously slowing everything very down slow. as well. Um, so not everything's all been seen in court yet, but we've the ones that have been seen, we've won. So we've, we got a, a, a high court judgment against somebody just a couple of months ago. We've been compensated multiple times. And um, we've had lots of apologies and different stuff, but there's still cases that are ongoing and it will take time. But yeah, totally. I mean, I've moved on from it. I think it's left a little bit of a scar. Some people, you know, still remember and bring up things. Oh, weren't you that guy with the bad articles? But I also think people now are more wise to the fact that newspapers are not trustworthy. And they just like bad news stories. And I think I've proved myself as well. Because at the time it was like, oh, is this guy, you know, legitimate? But it's like, come on, man. How many, how many years do I have to do a winners on a Wednesday and interview a successful student? Four years it's been. How many books do I have to publish where every chapter, there's 30 chapters and every chapter is about one of my students who's become financially free from my training. How many books do I need to, before people go, 
maybe he's right. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know what more I can really do. So I think now, I yeah, think it's just time, isn't it? Like people will forget and move on. The trouble was a few years ago. Yesterday's news was today's chip paper, wasn't it? Yeah. Whereas mm-hmm. today, once it's written and it's out there in the ether of the internet, it's there for years and years until you can physically get it tanked down. Even then, it's been copied somewhere else and posted again. I'll tell you the biggest lesson I learned actually. It's just come to me since being cancelled um, a few years ago. Is you've got to respond quickly to negativity because at the time, every person in my life and that I respected, every mentor, every PR agency was telling me, even my lawyers, don't entertain the trolls. Don't give it oxygen. So I was quite quiet about it. I didn't respond. But I think now looking back, I would have responded within an hour. So that That is yeah different to what I would think. Like I watch a lot of um, videos about the downfall of YouTubers and when they address the hate, it makes it more and more and it creates that mob. So why would you say addressing it is a good thing to do? Because silence is almost an admission of guilt. Yeah, you can produce a statement, can't you? But Not even the, the statement. The, the problem is sometimes when you react, it can be um, pouring petrol on the fire. I think, see, what, I did agree. you see what True Geordie did recently? Yes. Yeah, and he made his video apologising. Yeah, but it was an unauthentic video. The clickbait of him nearly crying, it, it looked like he's been defeated completely and it's like, well, now the mob's going to be even bigger. I, I thought it was a terrible decision. <laughs> mm. Of course, apologise, maybe in a statement, but not a 20, 30 minute video. No, but here's the thing. He responded, but he just did it in a bad way. If you look at my rebuttal videos, they'll fire. So when you don't put the facts on the table, people make stuff up. And what I've learned after being cancelled, and take it from me because you guys haven't been cancelled. If you're getting people going after you, it's making stuff up that's not true and it's spreading... You need to nip it in the bud and you need to very quickly address it. And sue people. Sue people. People say, oh, if I sue them, it's going to be really loads of energy. It's going to be loads of money. The lawyers are the ones that end up winning. No, sue them. It's just part of business. Sue them. If someone says something that's not true, if someone breaks down your wall, they have to pay for it to be built again. That's just the law. Mm. Someone comes and smacks down your wall, you're like, oh, I smacked it down. Oh, that's going to cost me an arm and a leg. No, sue them. I, I think it depends on your personal brand though. Like obviously you're seen as the businessman uh, entrepreneur. You can get away with suing them. But if you are like a, a YouTuber and you have this wholesome personality and you go around suing everyone, then it might impact your brand. So it does depend who you are. No, because it's wholesome to sue people because you can say, look, I'm a wholesome person. I'm, you But know, you know how things can be twisted. No, no, but I'm running my business. I'm a wholesome person. These people are saying stuff. They're going after my staff. They're going after my family. And it's not right. And mm. to protect, as a beautiful hearted soul that I am, to protect my family and my staff and my reputation, I had to sue them. I can sue people because I'm rich. Yeah. Well, that's the key, isn't it? This is it? what worries me. It's very expensive it to is. sue someone and then it to go to court as well. If you are average money and you make five grand a month or two, or two grand a month or whatever, and you've not got loads of money and you have a hate mob coming after you, It's really bad because defamation is high court and to sue somebody for defamation is very expensive. So I am, when I've finished and I've sued everybody and been compensated by everybody, I am going to dedicate my life to changing the system so that the average person, when they get trolled to high heavens, there's some kind of a law change that protects them because I do not even, I can't even, it makes me upset even thinking about somebody getting trolled to high heaven, lied about in the media and on social media, but the only way they can deal with it, because the police aren't interested, social media don't care, the only thing they can do is sue them in the high courts. And they can't, because they haven't got the money. What a tragedy. The rule needs to change. The law needs to change. And I will change it. So when is enough? Enough. Never, never, never. Because when enough is enough, you get miserable. Because if you're not, if you're not on a beach, pina coladas, <laughs> happiness is in progression. Yeah. So I'm not doing what I'm doing now for me. I'm doing what I'm doing now. Like I just said about the law thing. For me, there'll always be something. I need to change this. I just built a school last month in Uganda mm. and partnered with the Ugandan government. So it said I'll pay for the building as long as the kids have financial literacy in the curriculum. Mm. Never will be enough. There'll always be problems in the world that I am trying to change until I'm dead. It's a big place. It's a big place.
Thank you very much for coming on. I've really enjoyed it. Um, if you guys have as well, make sure to smash that thumbs up button for the YouTube algorithm and we will see you next Friday with a brand new podcast. So it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. Laters. See you later.